I'd like to welcome the young man who has taken this country by storm in the conversation that he started on Facebook and on, on YouTube three years ago, just as BJ Unity was launching. <laughs> My dear friend, Matthew Barnes. All right, this is actually my first trip to South Carolina and it is really great. This is an incredibly beautiful city that you all have here. Uh, I just wanna start by asking a few questions to get a sense of where people are coming from. Who here lives in Greenville? Who doesn't live in Greenville? Uh, who was born and raised here? Like in the South? No, in Greenville specifically. Um, who, is, who lives in South Carolina but not in Greenville? <laughs> Does any, how many people are from outside of the state? And keep your hands up if you do not even live in the South. All right, two people. <laughs> um, and so I come from, I guess I should raise my hand too, because I live in Kansas, which is part of the, depends who you talk to, part of the Midwest, Great Plains, the heartland. And I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, in a conservative, evangelical, Presbyterian church that has a lot in common with, I think, what a lot of the churches here in Greenville would believe and teach when it comes to same-sex relationships. I, when I, and I guess the other question I want to ask before I dive into sort of my story is I want to, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but just to get a sense of who's here, if you are and you feel comfortable saying that you are straight, raise your hand. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Say what? Oh, so people can't see me, so I'm gonna go up on the stage, apparently. And then, should I, should I just stand here? Is that it? Okay, I'll just stand here on the side. All right. Um, and then raise your hand if you are comfortable, and don't worry, I'm going to go through multiple options, so if this one doesn't resonate with you, <laughs> more options will be coming. Uh, if you identify as gay, that's a lot of people. Uh, if you identify as, yeah, that's right, let's clap for the gay people. If you identify as lesbian. Someone was like, oh, I, I should have waited, okay. <laughs> If you identify as bisexual, all right. I like this idea of clapping for everyone. All right. If you identify as transgender, or under the sort of trans umbrella, gender non-conforming in general, and of course, if you don't want to answer, you do not have to answer. This is just if you feel comfortable answering. Um, how many of you identify today as Christians? Does anybody feel comfortable sharing that they do not identify as a Christian? I'm gonna take off my jacket. How many of you did not grow up in a Christian home? Wow, that was an easier question <laughs> to answer than the alternative. Uh, how many of you are in a place where, and again, just to reiterate for the fourth time, only if this is something you feel comfortable saying where you're at, how many of you would say that you're in a place of um, supporting or affirming same-sex relationships? And how many of you would say that, that's, that you're not in that same place, if you feel comfortable? Um, and I just think it's wonderful to have people coming from multiple perspectives. So thank you so much for coming, especially if you don't come from the perspective that I'm coming from. I think that's a really commendable thing, and I really appreciate it. Um, the, then the last sort of initial question, how many of you have, who do feel like you are affirming of same-sex relationships, have close friends or family members who are not? And for how many of those people is their understanding of the Bible a core part of the reason why they are not? <laughs> right, someone's like, well, that was, that was redundant. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I, I feel like there's, so we have a lot of, there's a lot of commonality, or a lot of commonalities in this space already, and that is, gives me a good sort of starting point for sharing where I'm coming from. I, fortunate, I was fortunate enough not to 
come to terms with the fact that I was gay until I was 19. I could have acknowledged that about myself far sooner, but I really didn't want to. The church that I grew up in was, in many ways, a great church. Some people, you'll hear these horrible church stories where they grew up in a church that was abusive or just an incredibly toxic environment in a thousand different ways, but that was not my church story at all. My, it was a Presbyterian church that was part of the Presbyterian Church USA, but they actually left that denomination over this issue several years ago. So it's part of the more, it's part of the evangelical, it was part of the evangelical wing of the PCUSA that is now a, did part of a different Presbyterian denomination. There was, I mean, I, that's where, so I asked Jesus to come into my heart when I was three years old, um, driving home from, I was not driving, I was writing. Uh, <laughs> riding home from Sunday school, where they had said that all you have to do is ask him into your heart and he will come and he will be the, you know, the Lord and savior of your life. And nobody was talking, and so I was in the back seat, and I asked him into my heart. I drew a little door on my heart, and I know, I'm like, oh, I was adorable. And, <laughs> and I opened it up, and I gave him a full 60 seconds to make it, because I, I knew he was pretty high in the sky. And, but then once he made it, I closed it, locked it, and I did this like every year for the next 10 years. Just to make sure, you never know if he's fallen out one night. <laughs> um, and not that I really thought that, but it can never hurt, right? Just to make sure. And I, my parents are, were both leaders in the church, were married there, my grandparents had been there since the 60s, and my parents imparted to me and my sister, who's a couple years older than me, a really humble, loving version of faith and of belief in Jesus. So it was very easy for us to not only accept, but to really actively desire to have Jesus be at the center of our lives, because we saw how that played out in our parents' lives, in their relationship, and in so many of their most important friendships. That was something that we really wanted, and so we were very involved in church from a young age, and it was an incredibly stable, supportive, loving community in so many ways, for a while. Um, that did start to change. Um, and when I first noticed it changing was actually the first time I ever learned that there were gay people. And I learned that there were gay people when I was 12 years old. I was part of a, I was in the chorus of this, of this musical theater production that was being put on, it was a professional company, so they had a number of adult actors there. And some of them I learned during rehearsals were gay. And I, I remember I talked to my mom about that. And the first thing I said is, it bothers me that I don't think these people would be welcome at our church. And she said, well, Matthew, I mean, it's just like anything else, you know, they just need to be willing to stop living the way that they're living. Uh, they need to be willing to turn away from that lifestyle and then they would be welcome like anyone else. And I said, oh yeah, I get that, but it still doesn't feel like they would be welcome. <laughs> and that was sort of where that conversation landed then. But then as I met more gay people in high school and especially in college, I felt an incredible degree of tension and dissonance inside about the teaching of my church, what my parents believed about this, and what I felt in my heart was not an acceptable way to be responding to people. So I actually, so I went, in 2008, I graduated from high school and I went off to Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is totally, totally different from both Greenville and Wichita. <laughs> and one of the most socially progressive cities in the country those differences, honestly, in most ways, weren't very good for me. Um, it didn't feel like the happiest place. I desired a lot of the warmth and openness and support that I had found back home that was not nearly as easy to find there. But one big difference that I appreciated was there was so much more openness to LGBT students. That's where I learned that there are more than just gay people. And so that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and it wasn't even a controversy. At that time, Massachusetts was the only state in the country that recognized same-sex marriage. And being able to live in a, in a place where same-sex married couples with children were a completely normal part of the social fabric, and in fact valued and respected, blew my mind and allowed me to contemplate possibilities for what my future could look like that I had never been able to consider before. And so living there for two years allowed me then my sophomore year at school to finally ask myself whether or not I might be gay. It was not a happy day, to put it lightly. Um, even though I'd already come to a place on a personal level and in my InterVarsity Christian Fellowship group 
of talking it through with other people, having some Bible studies on the topic, of feeling like this was a justice issue and feeling passionate about it for other people, it was still very difficult to process for myself because there was no precedent for any kind of acceptance or support where it mattered most, which was back home and in my family and my church. So I went home, came out to my, the one recent precedent prior to my coming out was that I had a, we had a friend who was a couple years older, had grown up in church, was really well liked until his sophomore year of college he came out. And then no one would ever talk about him anymore. And it felt like he had been erased from the community and people wanted it to be as though he had never existed because the shame and the stigma and the taboo was so strong. Even my mom, who loved him, was devastated and in tears for days when she found out that he was gay. And she could only talk about him in hushed tones at church to other people. And I just remember being so frustrated by that. And just thinking, how is that? And the thing that I wanted to do, actually, I was like, you know what would be great? You know, I know that he's been struggling with things. Why? I know people are in different places on this topic. Why don't we just have a forum at church where like, the people who have been coming out can just get up and talk about their experiences and people can learn from it. It doesn't mean everyone has to be in the same place. People can learn. And so they don't have to suffer in silence. Well, that was naive. <laughs> because then I ended up coming out, uh, coming home, coming out to my parents. That went well, given where they were at. They were not in a place, they were not ready to hear that. They were completely stunned, even though not that many of my peers were that stunned. Um, and my dad was convinced homosexuality was a sin. He wanted me to get fixed. He wanted me to become straight. And I decided to take a whole semester off from school to work through this conversation with my parents. Because I love my parents. I've always been very close with both of them. And I wanted to maintain that. And so I decided just to put a pause, sort of hit pause on life and work through this with them. The main thing, after my dad began to realize that being gay is not a, a switch that you can flip on and off, he was th still then very concerned about how he had been taught scripture on this subject, which is believing that the Bible and God are completely against homosexuality and that in order to love someone who's gay, you don't love them by affirming their sin, you love them, I'm sure no one's heard this before, um, you love them by you know, encouraging them to turn away from their sin. And for him, he thought that would be, at first he thought that would be marrying someone of the opposite sex when he realized that was, for a lot of people, not a good option. He then thought, well, maybe that's celibacy. But he told me, I'm willing to consider another perspective. I just, you just need to show me what that is. And so that was another strong incentive to stay home and help to show him that other perspective. When I'd worked through this, I mean, I'd worked through this as I talked about in my Bible study at college, but not to the level, I had enough relationships with people and experience and awareness and understanding of the LGBT community that I think my bar for persuasion was not quite as high as his was. Um, whereas he did not know, I was the first openly gay person my dad ever met. And certainly the first openly gay Christian. And so he was pretty firm in his beliefs, but because he loved me, and because he loves me, he was willing to reconsider, even though I don't think he would have been willing to reconsider uh, for all that many people. And I found, so I wanted to find I wanted to keep diving into those Bible resources that I've been studying, and I found sort of two main types of resources. One were very academic texts that had great research in them, but they were so esoterically presented that you couldn't reasonably give that to somebody who has two jobs and four kids and say, hey, please read this 600-page scholarly tome over the weekend and like, let me know what you think. I think that's, people just don't have the time to do that. So then the other types of resources that I found were at a more popular level, but Almost all of them that I found were clearly not written to my father. And they were not written to Christians who are certainly more conservative in their theology, who really revere scripture and are willing to listen, but don't share a lot of basic presuppositions that those authors clearly started with. So when someone started off saying, well, if, if you write off people who disagree as being haters or bigots, um, I don't want to give that to my father because I know my father and I love and respect him and I know that he's not a hateful man. He's, he doesn't have it out for anyone. I would love, you know, at that point I, was, I would really love him to open up more and to learn more, but I respected him where he was and I wanted, and so when I found resources that didn't convey that same respect, I didn't want to share them because I didn't think that that would be something that he would 
benefit from or appreciate. The, and I also found a bunch of resources that would start off with just a different view of the Bible than what I had been raised with and what my parents and our church held. If you start off saying, well, the Bible says a lot of wacky things, and so we just need to not worry about it too much. Then from the beginning, you're raising the stakes of the conversation in a huge way to be, it's not just about how you interpret these six texts, it's actually about whether or not you see the Bible as fully authoritative and inspired for the lives of Christians today. And if that's the question, then it's a fundamental question of differing worldviews and significantly different approaches to Christian faith, not simply differing interpretations of several texts. And I didn't want to give those resources to my dad because not only would that not be persuasive to him, it also wasn't very, it wasn't very satisfying for me. Because when you grow up in an evangelical church, you typically learn your Bible really well. And there may be, oftentimes, my friends who've not grown up in Christian homes at all, their main exposure to scripture is when they see scripture being used as what appears to them as a weapon to put other people down. And it can put them off of scripture altogether and make it very easy for them to say, to disregard scripture. And this idea of needing to treat scripture as authoritative or as norm, you know, the norm that norms to them just seems kind of an alien concept. But when you have grown up with Jesus, learning about Jesus through the Gospels and learning about God through all of these Bible stories from age two on, there is so much richness and obvious truth and beauty and an anchoring there, a fundamental anchoring of who you are in the world, who you are in relation to God and other people, that you can't just say, oh, I'm going to step away from that because I'm struggling with this one aspect of it. It is far too deeply ingrained in who you are and in a way that, you don't, that I didn't want to let go of because I can't imagine an anchoring in my life that could be nearly as satisfying uh, and nearly as meaningful or true as the anchoring that I've always had in Jesus. So I, that's why I decided what I wanted to do was to try to find a lot of the best insights and ideas within sort of the ivory tower of scholarship, but then make it a lot easier to understand and make sure that I was presenting it in a way that was actually approaching scripture the way that I had learned to approach scripture growing up. So oftentimes that means some of the resources that I'd be drawing on were written by people who are not even Christians. Maybe it's because you're talking about historians and sometimes the best historical work in a field is written by an atheist or someone who's agnostic or someone of a different faith. Sometimes it's written by a Christian but somebody who, somebody who definitely does not have the same view of scripture that I or my parents had, but they often do have their solid insights in there as well. And so you can, you can learn a lot about history, interpretations of texts, about the, a lot of different debates, but there's also a limit to just how much you can take from that. So I tried to take what I felt was good and true and helpful, but then be approaching the broader hermeneutical framing of that in a way that was consistent with my church's understanding of scripture and the way that I continue to understand scripture today. So that then was the, and I just felt so frustrated initially that I could not, that I could not find resources that were speaking to me and my parents where we were at because there is no more vulnerable time for someone when they need these resources than when they are coming out to parents who are not in a place of understanding sexual orientation gender identity, and scripture. And if we, can't, if, we, if we don't have resources until people have been in the spiritual wilderness for 20 years, then they finally make it back to a much more progressive church, and then they have a Bible and homosexuality class designed by, presented by, and for people who are already all in agreement, then that may give them a lot of consolation 20 years later. But can't we do better than that? Can't we meet people in their most vulnerable times? And so I remember looking online um, when, I was, when I realized that I was gay, there was nothing that I wanted more, not to know that my parents would still love me, not to know that my church would support me. The thing I wanted more than anything was to understand the Bible and homosexuality. Because that, even if, because that's why you're concerned that your parents won't still love you, or that your church won't want you around, or that all these relationships will be ruptured. I had worked through this enough at an impersonal level not to feel an agonizing sense that God had abandoned me, I feel blessed not to have experienced that, which a lot of gay people, that's not their experience. They realize that they're gay at a younger age when they don't have 
as when they haven't been able to think through it, and so they've only received one message, and then they feel like they can spend years and years suffering silently, feeling like God has rejected or abandoned them. And I didn't feel that way, but even then, I, you want to understand the Bible and homosexuality in order to know if that firm anchoring that you have in life can still be there for you in the same way, in how you understand your faith, and how you understand the Bible. And that's a huge deal. So I remember looking on YouTube, and I wanted to go find like some hour-long video, just like broke it all down for someone in my situation. I couldn't find it. So I ended up, to, you know, fast forward to years, I decided that I wanted to make that video. And in fact, I decided that within just a few weeks of coming out, because I knew that those are the types of resources that don't exist for you now, and I don't just want to figure this out for myself. I want to figure it out in a way that can then be accessed by people who aren't able to take a bunch of time off school and have parents who are open enough to let them stay at home and work through this conversation with them. And so then, so that video is what I posted uh, three years ago this month. Then last year, I published uh, this book, God and the Gay Christian, The Biblical Case in Support of Same-Sex Relationships, which is a considerably more expanded or comprehensive argument than what I could make in an hour-long talk. I also, in 2013, launched an organization called the Reformation Project, and we work to train LGBT-affirming Christians with the Bible-based tools that they need to shift the conversation in their churches. And actually, in the back of the room, if you'd like to say hello to her, is Amelia Markham. Um, she is our Southeast, raise, say, raise your hand. She, she is the Southeast organizer for the Reformation Project, and so she works with Christians in churches all throughout the Southeast who are wanting to open up a much more constructive, gracious conversation on this topic in their churches. Typically, what I've found is that in more conservative churches and evangelical churches, there are a number of people, not a majority, but most times, but a number of people who wish that it weren't so, who feel very conflicted internally, but, or who even feel in their hearts like they support the LGBT community, but they don't know how to talk about scripture and LGBT inclusion, and so they don't talk at all. They don't speak up about what they believe because they feel like they, they feel like they would just be shredded in what would become a debate that they're not prepared to have on this topic. And I don't, I don't think the debate is typically the best format um, for these conversations, although sometimes debates can be useful. But in general, this is about conversations in the context of relationship and family and love and community. But even then, people need to be prepared. People need to have a sense of confidence and, and a greater sense of knowledge. And so the Reformation Project, we organize conferences around the country to help train Christians who want those Bible-based tools with them. Our next conference is in Atlanta, June 11th through the 13th. Um, and that's open registration at reformationproject.org. Amelia has flyers for that too that she'll be passing around. And also she's passing around a sign-up sheet for our mailing list if you are interested for all the kinds of training programs that we're gonna be doing. The Atlanta Conference is really just kind of a launching pad for greater training efforts throughout the Southeast for people who go there and then wanna go back to their home states, be it South Carolina, be it Mississippi, Arkansas, and really be working to help to open up this conversation where we have not been able to do that. Now I just wanna talk some about the basic argument that I make in my book, uh, that I made in my video, but that I expand on in the book in terms of my core message in the book is that Christians, and especially evangelical Christians, can both fully affirm the Bible's authority and also fully affirm same-sex marriage. That has sort of been the question that so many Christians have had. Is that possible? And the, there have been, within the, also the language that I use in, I tried not, when I wrote my first draft of my book, I tried not to use any labels in it at all to describe different groups of thought on this, but my editor said, this has gotten too unwieldy. <laughs> you have to pick some labels. So I ended up settling with the labels that I, that I use are those Christians who are affirming of same-sex relationships and those Christians who are non-affirming of same-sex relationships. Because if there's something that, you know, like I feel like you know, I am non-affirming of you know, promiscuity and things like that, I don't feel offended by you know, that statement. And I've had a number of people who disagree with me say that they appreciate that kind of language, that they appreciated the way that they were, the way that I addressed them in the book. So I feel like, all right, you know, no one is, no one is you're not gonna ha ever have everyone be happy with the labels that you use, but I'm always wanting to use the labels that will be most helpful in making people feel respected and honored and invited into a conversation rather than feel attacked um, from the outset. 
So labels like pro-gay and anti-gay are typically very unhelpful. Um, I meet very few Christians who disagree with me on this topic who appreciate being called anti-gay um, because they feel like that speaks to their motives in a disrespectful way, and so I don't want to do that. Um, so the, within, over the last 40 years or so, since this conversation started in more progressive or mainline churches, there have been a number of different arguments. I guess two main types of arguments that affirming Christians, LGBT affirming Christians, have tried to make about the Bible. One of them would be what a lot of evangelicals would simply call a low view of scripture argument, which is to say, okay, Paul said this in Romans 1 about men and men and women exchanging the natural for the unnatural, but that was Paul, that wasn't Jesus. And Paul said other things that we may not agree with today. Fortunately, Jesus didn't say anything about homosexuality, and so we're just gonna focus on his general principles of love and justice. That approach has had some success and some traction in more progressive Christian communities. That approach will never succeed in more conservative Christian communities like the one I was raised in for the very reason I already described, which is that's asking people not simply to reinterpret several texts, but to change what they believe about the Bible's authority and what the Bible is. I don't want to do that. My parents don't want to do that because that is, when people talk about sort of slippery slopes, um, oftentimes people sometimes present not the most fair or helpful arguments, especially in the political realm. But when it comes to the theological realm, there is something to be said about the potential for a broader or deeper unraveling um, in terms of your doctrinal foundation if you say, you know, I'm going to shift on this by making a fundamental change, like at the foundation of how I approach scripture, that could absolutely have implications that are unforeseen or that will ultimately not be beneficial to the thriving, to your faith thriving. At least that's my perspective. And I, so, so that sort of approach is that one approach that affirming Christians have said, which is to say, well, you know, Bible says this, but Jesus didn't say it. I don't, that, you know, I don't, I spent about, you know, two seconds thinking about that approach. And well, okay, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to listen to different perspectives, but I'm saying I didn't think that was a viable approach for what would be satisfying to me as a Christian. And then the other alternative has been, among more affirming Christians, has been to try to respect the Bible's authority while drawing some distinction between the types of same-sex relationships that are condemned in scripture versus those that we are discussing today in terms of same-sex marriage or LGBT Christians in the church. And that approach is, in theory, promising. In practice, oftentimes has looked like a lot of people are throwing everything at the wall to see what will stick. And you'll end up with a lot of internally inconsistent or contradictory arguments uh, that people will have, have, or arguments that feel like they were so, sort of uh, pulled out of thin air. One of the main arguments that I've heard that I still don't know where it started was when people are talking about, and I guess I'll say, before, how many of you feel, so I'll just, you know, there are six passages in scripture that directly refer to same-sex behavior. Three of them are in the Old Testament, three of them are in the New Testament. How many of you feel very familiar with those six passages? And how many of you don't feel very familiar with those six passages? How many of you think that you could recite them all verbatim? <laughs> right. So all, but just there, so in the Old Testament, and I'll, I'll be primarily focusing on the New Testament tonight, but in the Old Testament you have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. And then you have two prohibitions in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 18 and 20. In the New Testament, you have a passage by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, as well as two texts, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 1 Timothy 1, 10, where it, we have two Greek words that may refer to same-sex behavior. Especially the most significant text in most church debates today is going to be Romans 1 because that's part of the New Testament, it's part of the New Covenant. Oftentimes people will point to Leviticus and acknowledge that while Leviticus does, in Leviticus 18 and 20, prohibit male same-sex relations, Leviticus is also part of the Old Covenant. And that doesn't mean that the restrictions or commandments that we find in the Old Testament are somehow all things we would not agree with today, but there are, and people will point to plenty of other things in the Old Testament that are consistent with a Christian 
vision of morality and ethics, but the fact that they are in the Old Testament in and of itself is not sufficient to be the reason why we would think that. Everything in the Old Testament has to be looked through, at the, through the lens of the New Covenant, through the lens of Jesus. So that's why people will, so people will make different arguments about Leviticus, whether or not they believe that it should or should not continue to apply today. But at the end of the day, typically those, those differences come down to how people read the New Testament texts. And then also we have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, which I'll just touch on for a couple minutes. This is in Genesis. Um, who here who is, okay, who here who is gay has ever had anyone refer to this story as part of the reason why they cannot support you? Yeah, a number of people. And in fact, when I was in high school, I remember asking my dad why, again, we were against gay rights. Because I knew that we were, but it also, I didn't really get why because it didn't seem like a terrible thing. And so he sat me down and pulled out his Bible and opened it to Genesis 19. And he read about this passage where God sends two angels in the form of men to the city of Sodom. And Abraham's nephew, Lot, invites them to stay with them. But when they do, all the men from all the part from everywhere in the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house and called out to Lot to bring out the men who came to you tonight so that we can have sex with them. Lot offers his virgin daughters instead. The men are not satisfied. Fortunately, the angels blind the men, thwarting their attack plan, and God destroys the city with fire and brimstone. So my dad closed the Bible and said, that's why we're against gay rights. These are men who wanted to have sex with other men and God destroyed them for it. Fast forward several years, I will say today, my dad only allows me to share that story with reluctance <laughs> because he feels embarrassed today that he once understood the text that way. Um, because when we started studying this more closely in 2010, that was the first passage where he started, where some lights started to go off in his head and he started to say, wait a second. Like, because when we started studying this, he thought, his understanding was, he said, I'm going to study this with Matthew, but through this process, Matthew is going to see the light, Matthew will be convicted, and will come to see things my way. So he was not expecting or anticipating to change his mind, but this was the first passage where he realized that what he thought he knew didn't hold up nearly as well as he expected it would once he investigated it further. The first obvious aspect of that text to note in this conversation is that we're talking about an attempt, a threatened gang rape. And for it's not just that they have a sexual romantic interest in these men. There's a parallel story in Judges chapter 19 in which men surround a house demanding to have, to quote, have sex with this man who's visiting. Instead, they end up gang raping his female concubine all night until she dies, horrifically. And the, pro the issue there, it's, it's a very similar uh, sort of request and broader context of that story. They're not wanting to find romantic or sexual satisfaction. Gang rape of men by men was a common tactic of aggression and humiliation in the ancient world because in a highly patriarchal society, as all ancient societies were, for a man to be treated as a woman was to emasculate him. And women were widely seen as being of far less value than men. And so for a man to rape another man is sort of the ultimate humiliation that he could inflict on that person. It's not about sexual interest or attraction. So that story, and then, but there are 20 times that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is referred to throughout scripture. In no case is same-sex behavior specified as the sin of Sodom. There are two times in the New Testament where sexual immorality in general is mentioned, but not same-sex behavior specifically. Ezekiel in chapter 16 quotes God as saying, now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant and overfed they were haughty and did not lift a hand to care for the poor and the needy. So as my dad began to first just look at the text again and realize, this is not really the kind of relationship that you want, Matthew, is it? <laughs> not that he had to ask, but of course it's not. And, but even more than that, in how the Bible talks about Sodom and Gomorrah going forward, same-sex relationships are not on the radar screen at all. And so for my dad, the, those, and then also the same thing with Leviticus, uh, he, you know, he's sort of, He's, he was realizing, okay, you know, yes, th these prohibitions are there at the same time. That's not sufficient on its own to resolve this conversation. 
because of the status of the Old Testament law under the New Covenant in Christ. So the much more significant text, certainly for my dad and for so many of the more conservative Christians in my life, is Romans 1. And so specifically, raise your hand if you feel familiar with Romans 1, 26 through 27. And if you don't feel familiar with Romans 1, 26 through 27. So for those who don't, just some brief background. In Romans 1 through 3, Paul is writing to a mixed Jewish-Gentile audience, and he's making the case that everybody, whether they're Jewish or Gentile, is in need of Christ's offer of salvation. And he says to his fellow Jews in Romans 2 that even though they have God's law, none of them keep it perfectly, and even one infraction of the law renders a person in need of reconciliation and salvation. But for the Gentiles, they don't have the law, and so he makes a different argument and says that they don't need the law to know about God because God makes himself plain through what is made, through the creation. And so he talks about people who knew of God's existence and worshipped God but turned away from God to worship idols instead. As a result, this is kind of how the message would put it, a kind of paraphrase, God said, okay, if you don't want me at the center of your lives, then live your life without me at the center of your life and see how that works out for you. It doesn't work out very well. By the end of this text, uh, and the, the relevant section is in the middle, by the end of this text, Paul lists 21 different vices, um, none of them in the last section, sexual, of what these people are given over to when they simply turn into themselves as opposed to centering their lives around God. Lots of terrible things, murder, envy, slander, hatred, inventors of evil. In the middle section, Paul says that God gave them up to shameful lusts, and that even their women exchanged natural relations for those that are against nature. In like manner, he says, the men abandoned natural relations with women and became inflamed with lust for one another. They committed indecent acts with each other and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. This is a strikingly negative statement about same-sex behavior, and I think that it's largely futile to attempt to sort of erase the strongly negative force of Paul's words as such. There will be some people, I've read some arguments, people try to say, oh, well, unnatural and shameful here could really be understood to mean something that's ethically neutral. I, I've never found that approach to be particularly helpful or convincing. They're not ethically neutral. Theoretically, um, and people will say, well, in Romans 11, it, you know, God grafts the Gentiles against nature. That's true. However, when Paul is describing sexual behavior that he says goes against nature and is shameful and degrading, this is not ethically neutral. These are clearly different uses of, like, the contexts are not the same. So what then to do with that? I could just, I'm, I'll just like finish now. Be like, okay. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I hope this was like an affirming message for you. Um, but, so the basic case that I make in my book is, and another, another thing people will do, and that some more affirming Christians have done with this text, is to try to pick out some really specific circumstance that supposedly was going on in the ancient world and pin this text entirely on that circumstance. The most common thing that I've heard, and I, I was getting this before, I don't know where this came from, is that this is really about temple cultic prostitution, and that in Corinth, where Paul wrote this letter, there was a temple to the goddess Aphrodite, and so there'd be gender-neutral orgies there on a regular basis, and that's what Paul is inveighing against in this text. First of all, Modern scholars disagree about whether or not temple prostitution was even practiced at all in Paul's day. Secondly, this text is far too generic and sweeping in its language to be specified as about being one specific practice like that. To, to a lot of people, to a lot of evangelicals, that will just feel like grasping at straws. And so what I want people to do is not try to focus on some specific circumstance but rather to back out and look at the look at much bigger picture concepts and categories that are at play in this text. And the case that I make in my book is that specifically in the ancient world, same-sex attraction and behavior were regarded not as a unique sexual orientation of a minority of people, but instead as a vice of excess that any person might engage in if they lost self-control. So I'll say that again. In the ancient world, same-sex attraction and behavior were widely regarded not as a unique sexual orientation, but instead as a vice 
of excess like gluttony or drunkenness that any person might do if they did not keep their self-control. In the same way that all of us have the same appetite for food. We all need to eat something, but we all could take it too far. We could engorge ourselves on food and become gluttonous. And as Christians, we shouldn't do that. We should have a more moderate, restrained approach to how we eat. The same thing is true with drink. You can have a moderate approach to drinking, and everybody's that sort of stands in the same appetite, or you could take things too far and become ragingly drunk. Anyone can do that. The fact that someone has been gluttonous one evening or gotten drunk one night does not mean that they are a different type of person or that they have a different type of desire for food or desire for drink than you do. They're an ordinary person with the same appetite as you who simply was excessive in their pursuit of the same appetite that you have. In like manner with sex, the idea, the dominant paradigm that we find throughout ancient literature, especially from more conservative moralists who would take issue with same-sex behavior, the dominant paradigm is that everyone has the same appetite, the same drive for sex. In moderation, this will manifest itself in opposite sex desire and behavior. But some people are not satisfied with that. Some people want to take things further. They want, in, in the same way, some ancient authors compare this to people who have food, but they just need to add salt and a bunch of other condiments to it in order to try to make it more pleasing to them because, and what actually happens in this process, it's not actually pleasing. For anyone who's ever witnessed or experienced something like that in any arena, the more that you try to add on to it, simply you dull your senses and then you want more and more, but you're not actually experiencing greater satisfaction anyway. You just become sort of lost in yourself and in your, in your own appetites. And so in that way, same-sex attraction and behavior was not what some people do because either they were born that way or because something happened to them through nurture or their childhood that made them sexually different. No, they're not sexually different. They are sexually the same and simply not controlled people. Now, what people would say is, and there, there, there's one text that I want to read just to help illustrate, because for a lot of people, this is such a different paradigm than what we sort of think of today here. Dio Chrysostom was a first century orator, Greek orator, and this is what he said about same-sex behavior. He said, the man whose appetite is insatiate in such things, referring to sex with women, when he finds there is no scarcity, no resistance in this field, will have contempt for the easy conquest and scorn for a woman's love as a thing too readily given, in fact, too utterly feminine, and will turn his assault against the male quarters, eager to befoul the youth who will very soon be magistrates and judges and generals, believing that in them he will find a kind of pleasure difficult and hard to procure. Plato in the fourth century wrote about why some people both men and women engage in same-sex behavior. And he said the reason that they do is because it stems from a boldness for like, desire out of control. It's not because if this had been 100 years ago with a Freudian paradigm, he would have said the reason some people engage in same-sex behavior is because they had an overbearing mother and a too distant father. <laughs> and even though that's not the way that the majority of us would be thinking about sexual orientation today, even that idea indicates an understanding that some people are different. And the question is why? Whereas in most ancient texts we find it's just what I described. And so there are two, again, there are two approaches that you can have to that too. Some people could just say, well, if that's the case, then that paradigm is wrong. We know that that's not true. That's not why some people are in same-sex relationships. And so that means that Paul and the biblical authors were wrong or were ignorant. I do not think that this is the best approach or the best understanding of that. Because when we actually look at the broad collection of ancient literature from the Greco-Roman world, from ancient Mesopotamia, from the Mediterranean, we find, especially when it comes to gender and sexuality, the vast majority of same-sex behavior that we see discussed and practiced fits pretty neatly into this paradigm of self-seeking excess. So some of the main forms of same-sex behavior that were practiced and approved of in different quarters in the ancient world would be sex between masters and slaves. Masters who are married, men married to women, who also would be able to use their male or female concubines and slaves as sexual, additional sexual outlets for self-gratification without significant social scorn 
or prostitution, not temple prostitution specifically. And whenever anybody who's wanting to make an affirming case says temple prostitution, I always just want to encourage them to chop off the word temple because their case would be a lot stronger. There's plenty of, plenty of evidence of run-of-the-mill prostitution in the ancient world, in, well, including same-sex prostitution. There's far less compelling evidence of temple prostitution specifically. So I just say, you know, set the temple word to the set. Um, another form would be pederasty. This was more common in ancient Greece than in Rome. These are relationships between adult men and adolescent boys that were actually fairly widely accepted in Greece. Uh, and obviously that's not something anyone, any, any of us would be looking on favorably today. In Rome, it was structured along different class lines, but was still a part of the general picture. All of, in every one of these cases, these are not monogamous, faithful, long-term relationships. These types, if, if, if that's sort of the main paradigm or the main pictures of same-sex behavior people have, then when people are reading Romans 1 about men abandoning relations with women, going off inflamed with their lust, and the way that Paul describes it is, seems to be in a context that is fleeting, not in a context of a long-term covenant relationship. Then some people will say, well, okay, even if that was the main form of same-sex behavior, surely there were some same-sex couples living out their lives similar to what we see today, and all, there, all we need to find is an example of one of them, because we can assume that Paul was very well read, so if we find even an example of one of them, then we'll say that Paul knew about that example, and because he made no exception clause in Romans, that he wanted to encompass that under his condemnation. There are some examples, not a ton, there are some examples of long-term, loving, consensual, same-sex relationships in the ancient world. However, there is still a critical distinction between those and what we're talking about today, which is that there are not examples of those relationships between equal status partners. There was an emperor in the Roman, a Roman emperor in the early second century named Hadrian, who fell madly in love with a slave of his named Antinous. And in fact, Antinous tragically died in a river. He drowned in a river, and Hadrian then erected statues of him across the land. The only reason, there's, the reason why that could not have Hadrian's reputation in tatters is because Antinous was a slave, because there was a clear class distinction. And in every one of those cases of same-sex behavior that I was describing, there is a difference in status. The way that we think about, and this does not just apply to same-sex relationships in the ancient world, this applies to all sexual relationships. The idea of equal status marriages between men and women was largely inconceivable in antiquity. Why? Well, Aristotle, who's one of the leading lights, leading thinkers of the ancient world, and had lots of great things to say. We know that he got some things with astronomy wrong, but do you know what he said about women? <laughs> What he said is some people do. Um, he said that all, all babies are supposed to be boys. Half the time, something goes wrong. <laughs> and that's when you get girls. Plato was seen as the most pro-women of the ancient Greek philosophers because he thought that women deserved a shot at an education. Plato also believed that men who were lazy and cowardly in this life would fittingly be reincarnated as women. <laughs> So it's not just, uh, oftentimes Christians today who identify as complementarians when it comes to gender roles, believing that men should be in leadership positions in the church, women should not, believing that men should have the final say in all decisions in their relationships with their wives, and the wives should submit to their husbands in a way a husband should not submit to their wives. Christians who are complementarians today would say that they believe in equal value different roles for men and women. That was not a mantra that you're going to find throughout a lot of the ancient world. No, it's different role and different value. So that's why the way that, we, the way that a lot of us, in, both in, in the church today and even outside of the church, the way that a lot of people think about sex is that at least at its best, sex should be about mutuality and, and self, sorry, mutuality and self-giving. About, and we think, we see, sorry, I need water. <laughs> Can anyone give me, sorry, I'm just like, woo, okay. Um, and, and again, not everyone always lives that out. Oftentimes, people will make different decisions that they may think later were not great decisions, um, or that they may think were fine decisions, but that other people may not want to embrace for themselves. Those, but typically we see sex as something, as a pretty vulnerable thing, that you wouldn't want to share with someone who you saw as radically inferior to you. Something you'd want to share with someone you see as an equal. And for Christians, something you'd want to share with someone um, where there's a long-term commitment involved. 
That is not the main paradigm for thinking about sex in the ancient world. In the ancient world, you couldn't have sex with someone you saw as your equal. I mean, you could, but it wouldn't go over very well with anyone else. Because sex was not primarily about expressing love and mutuality. It was primarily about expressing status and dominance. That doesn't mean it was coercive, necessarily. Even in consensual relationships, sex, every sexual relationship and act is expressive of status and says something about who you are. And so as a man, you must dominate, and as a woman, you must submit. And if those gender roles are held to, the relationship, this is in secular Greco-Roman culture. The, the Israelites, the early, uh, and the early Jewish Christians and the early Christians obviously had a more conservative take on a lot of things. But when it comes to the broader secular Greco-Roman world, this is sort of the framework that I'm talking about, you could engage in lots of different sexual relationships. And as long as you were maintaining clear hierarchies, that's why a man, if you're a free male Roman citizen, you could have sex with a slave, a male slave, and as long as you are seen as being the dominant partner in that encounter or relationship, it's going to be okay. However, if you fall in love with another free male Roman citizen, and you want to build a life and a home together, you have a big problem on your hands. Because that kind of relationship subverts the very hierarchical structure on which the entire society is based. You can't have two men who are of the same social status in that kind of a relationship. Same thing with two women. And so even where we do find some examples, which are far from the norm, of loving same-sex relationships, they still lack this critical aspect of the equality of the partners that is pretty important to how Christians think about relationships. And even in, so the question, in the Christian tradition, you even see starting in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul saying some things about, and the Bible is, in the same way that the Bible is not an abolitionist treatise, the Bible is not a feminist 21st century um, treatise either. Uh, there are going to be a number of patriarchal themes and norms that we see reflected, not just in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. But the way that Christians think about that, the way that most Christians, at least in America, think about that with slavery today, and many of us think about it with gender roles, is it's not so much about what the text says in isolation, thank you, but, okay, but it's about what, the direction the text is moving in relative to its original culture. So if there's a liberating movement of the text, then when it comes to slavery, then Christians are warranted to continue that movement, especially as Jesus calls us to embrace, or to calls for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. So that's the way a lot of Christians look at gender roles as well. And so Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 talks about how it's not just the woman who yields authority over her body to her husband, but also the husband who yields authority over his body to his wife. And so we see these, this direction emerging of greater equality as an important value. But to, to back out and sort of close out the whole conversation about that text and that helps to frame my broader approach to scripture on this topic. For Paul, the same-sex behavior that he was describing fit neatly into the use of sex for self-seeking excess, expressing status, expressing dominance. What Christians, when, when the early Christians rejected same-sex behavior, they were rejecting it in favor of using sex for self-giving, for monogamy, for covenant relationship in marriage, for love, all of these things. Same-sex behavior, same-sex relationships, as they were tolerated in any degree in the ancient world, fit into the former categories. And Paul in Romans 1.32 actually says that the types of behavior he was describing, some people not only do, but also approve of. The types of same-sex relationships we're talking about today, the type of relationship that I would like to have one day, is a relationship based on self-giving, mutuality, covenantal commitment, love. Those are the norms that Christians have always honored in marriage, historically. Same-sex marriage was not on the radar screen in the ancient world. This was not a conversation, this has not been a conversation that Christians have been having when it comes to sexual orientation, gay people, gay Christians, until quite recently, until recent decades. The types of, so we don't have to say that Paul was wrong in his rejection. We can say, we, uh, we should affirm that when sexual behavior, whether it's opposite sex or same sex, is motivated 
by self-seeking lust, by a desire for the satisfaction of the self to the exclusion of the other, for all of these negative things, that that should not be affirmed. But when same-sex relationships are motivated by the themes and the norms of self-sacrifice, mutuality, and covenant that Christians have always honored in marriage, those need to be assessed differently. And that creates the space for Christians today to look at same-sex covenant relationships in a different light than we have before. Not by rejecting the authority of Paul, but by acknowledging that this is not what Paul was addressing. And that we are speaking to something different than what Paul was speaking to. And when we look at the broader biblical picture of marriage and sexuality, same-sex relationships can fit these core principles that undergird Christian marriage. Amen. Thank you.